Hello everyone, welcome back. If you're watching this video, I'm gonna assume that you're pretty new to Rainbow Six Siege. And in this video, I'm going to give you some tips, which I wish I had as a newcomer in this game, to help me understand maps more, my movement, aim, operator gadgets, everything. Siege can be quite a daunting game as a newcomer. I joined in year two, so I can't even imagine what it's like joining at the end of year eight. So watch this video to the end so you can get the most out of the tips I'm giving you, and this will jumpstart you on your Siege path. I do ask if you enjoy this video and it does help drop it a like and consider subscribing i appreciate it and let's get into this so firstly i'm going to cover operators i'm not going to take too long in this because i've said this before and i don't really have to go too deep into this anyway of course every operator has a unique ability there's so much to learn i can't explain it to you all in this video i have another video talking about what every operator does if you want to check that out but your best way to learn is by playing them however if you're brand new and you're struggling to start i recommend starting with sledge on attack and cap can on defense both both these operators have easy to control weapons, very understandable gadgets, and they're going to be a good starting off point for you. But the first major point I want to talk about are maps. Rainbow Six Siege has a pretty big pool of maps to choose from, all including destructibility, which makes them unique compared to pretty much any other FPS. Now, maps are going to be something which you're going to have to learn over time. You're going to die from positions you didn't even know existed, you're not going to understand the layout, it's going to be confusing. And I will use the advice that just simply Simply playing it will be the best way to learn. However, Ubisoft have also recently introduced a small mode called Map Drill. This is a pretty good little training exercise which will just basically tell you the name of a room and it will show you how to get there. This is a pretty fast little exercise and if you do it enough, you will start to get your bearings on a map. However, what works best for me when it comes to learning new maps is going into a custom game and pretty much doing a site setup by myself and looking for what strats I could use. I done this for the brand new map layer. I made an entire video of me doing it live and this just helped me learn the map so fast. So when it comes to learning the layout of the map, I do recommend simply playing them, the map drill mode and going into a custom game and just sort of messing around with it and finding your own setups. That will help you learn fast. However, there's another major aspect of maps in in this game and that is callouts. Every single room in Rainbow Six Siege has a name to it. If you look at the compass at the bottom of your screen, whenever you enter a room, it will tell you the name of that room. And a very helpful little tip is when you ping a location using your yellow ping, it will actually tell you the name of that room in which you have pinged. So if you're maybe playing with friends and you're struggling to call out, just ping the room that your drone is in or just look at the compass below you and you'll get the name of the room. And once again, simply playing is going to be a great way to learn this. Failure is the best teacher. Someone giving you a call out that there's an enemy in drum, for example, and then you die from that enemy. At least you know where drum is now. And the more experience you get, you'll start to get even more precise callouts. For example, on top floor Nighthaven Labs, this room is called Server. However, if someone's playing behind this middle bit and I want to be more precise, I'll say that someone is playing behind the pillar. This is something you're going to naturally pick up the more you play this game. And when it comes to callouts, you're definitely going to learn more if you play alongside people or have people on your team giving you callouts in return. You pretty much bounce off of each other. But I definitely think as a newcomer, looking at your compass and using that as just your starting point to learn callouts is going to go such a long way. Trust me. Right, let's move over to aiming. A lot of people always click on these videos like, this is how you get no recoil in Rainbow Six Siege. This is how I have no recoil on controller. XYZ. And I'm going to be honest with you, there isn't a secret hack. Just because Shaiko uses this sensitivity on PC or Jinxie uses this one on console doesn't mean it's going to instantly make you good as well. At the end of the day, sensitivity is purely preference. I personally play on a really low sensitivity on PC. Instead of making small movements with a higher sense, I like making large movements with my hand all across the mouse pad with a lower sensitivity. That's just what I like. But if you play on PC, you might be the complete opposite. Same with controller. Some people like high sensitivity, some people like low sensitivity. You can use these other creators and pro players as a starting point, and you may like their one, but at the end of the day, it's just what you get comfortable with. And it's also sticking with one. You're not going to be great with a brand new sensitivity instantly. You're going to have to get used to it. Yes, use all these different videos and other players as a starting off point, but don't let that judge what you use and how you should use it. Just because you use a different sensitivity than this number one ranked player doesn't mean that his sensitivity is better than yours. So once you have gotten a sensitivity pinned down, let's move on to aiming. Now, you lot are so lucky nowadays that there's so many different avenues for you to learn the gunplay in Siege. Back when I started, you only had the current modes of, you know, casual and rank. So if I missed that 
shot on the enemy player, that was me out till the next round. Well, nowadays, Rainbow Six Siege has a team deathmatch mode. This has no operator gadgets and there's respawns on. It's a fun little arcade casual mode, but this is absolutely incredible for training and learning your aim. Because if you miss a shot and you die, oh well, you respawn two seconds later and you can do it again. And the fact that you're going against other real people means it's going to be an accurate representation of what movement's going to be like in your live games. You can go into the shooting range and test against targets and like the moving balls, which is similar to aim lab. And don't get me wrong, those are still good aim trainers. However, there's just something about the arcade modes playing against other people, which just makes it feel a bit more natural. And this is a lot of people's preferable way to just even warm up before they play ranked. If you're a bit unconfident about your aim, play some TDM for a bit before you then start going into ranked matches. And also relating this onto the map point, this is also really good for learning maps as well. Now, not every map is in TDM or free for all or weapon roulette, whatever mode you play, but the maps that are in it are typically ones that are in ranked. And this is a great way to just get your feel for the layout as well as training your aim. Now let's move over to movement, another pillar you need to learn. There's gonna be a few things I'm talking about. Firstly, let's talk about crouching, walking and sprinting. A big mistake which even I make and a lot of people on high elo make is that they'll just sprint for no reason. For one, sprinting emits a lot of noise, which is gonna give away your position. and if you're sprinting and you come across a gunfight with another player, it takes a little bit of time to get your gun up again and readjust it. Sprinting should only properly be used if you're outside the map or if you're trying to reclaim a position really fast. You know the area is clear and you just want to progress to the next one with speed. With a bit of common sense, you will understand when you should and shouldn't sprint. However, the main time I recommend never sprinting is when you simply don't know what's ahead of you. You don't have control of the room in front, you've not droned it, you don't know it's clear, you should never be sprinting when you do that. In positions like that, you want to be slow walking. Make sure you're aiming down your sight and ready for a gunfight. You can even crouch as well to make yourself more hidden. And of course, you can prone in this game. This is pretty good if you're in a really tight position and need to duck, crawl out of positions, or even hiding in a corner. As with everything else, this will all come with time, and you'll start understanding when you need to aim, when you need to lean, when you need to crouch, because if you start doing that wrong, you're going to get caught up by the enemies quite a bit, and you're going to start realizing you're winning less. But this is something which is going to take time and people are probably going to make fun of you for having bad movement but as long as you just keep at it you'll start to get the hang of it very soon now next up is preparation this is something where a lot of people make mistakes as a defender your goal is to protect the two bomb sites most of the time bomb sites are just one room apart sometimes there'll be a hallway and in some other cases they can actually be above and below each other and reinforcing is a big part of siege but you want to make sure that you're not reinforcing reinforcing between sites. The whole point in reinforcing is to make sure that wall cannot be shot through and basically blocking people from entering it. And you don't want to limit the access between your two bomb sites because if you cut the rotation out between both of them, that means attackers are going to be able to claim one of them very easily and there's not really going to be much fighting back from the other side. Especially if the two bomb sites are connected with a hallway for example, if you reinforce both of them off, you're limited to that hallway which attackers can then pin down. And I know I'm teaching you that you need to use reinforcements to basically barrack arcade the two bomb sites whilst having a rotation between them but the more you start to understand strategies and maps there's going to be some locations where you're not even going to reinforce walls which you would think would keep you safer that is because then you're going to start exposing angles which can be used against the attackers there's a lot of strategy involved with a bunch of different walls but just make sure you're communicating with your teammates when reinforcing especially if you're not cured with them some of them might be wanting to do a specific strat which includes opening holes and walls instead of reinforcing them and you're going to reinforce them and probably annoy them. Communication is key in this game and that also is a big part in preparation as well. I'll give you an example just to explain it a bit better. Let's use top floor and bank. It is very common to put head holes on the wall by the top square staircase. Now if you're a new player you're probably thinking why would I not reinforce this off? This will slow down the attacker's push as well as providing me cover especially since attackers can just walk through that door at the top of the staircase there. And yes that way of thinking is correct, reinforcing this wall would give you more protection. However, on the flip side of this, making head holes here means us, as the defenders in the comfort of our own side, can pressure anyone who is now trying to enter at the top of the staircase. This now means that instead of them being able to take control of this since the walls are reinforced and they
they don't have to worry about anyone in the wall. They just have to focus on the hallway and the bottom of the staircase. They now have to worry about this big open angle from sight where there'll be defenders holding very tight angles. They might even have a DMR. And that just means there's going to be a bunch of different locations pressuring the attacker trying to push. But again, communication is key. There's no point in making holes here if no one's going to use them. And there's also no point in reinforcing it if you were going to use it because you're kind of just giving the attackers a bit of an easier access. That's the joy of Siege. It can be done in millions of different ways. There's no right or wrong, but there's definitely stuff that people prefer doing. Right, that is set up and prep for the defenders. On the attacker side, your goal is to use a drone and gain intel on the enemies. This is intel such as the site location and what defenders they brought. But a big mistake a lot of people will do is they'll just drive their drone straight into the bomb site, get it destroyed, and be like, eh, I found the bomb site and I detected they had like a warden and a Jaeger. I done my job. And yes, you did do something correct, but if you're going to go into the site and, you know, see what defenders they have and everything, I recommend only really doing it with one of the people on the team and the four other drones which are available, they're at the other side of the map setting up cameras for them when they go into the prep phase they can use to get access to the building. You know, what is the point of everyone putting their drone in sight where you can be strategic and place drones all the way into your entry point so then when your team is going to enter, you can go, okay, I've got a camera there. Yep, that bit's clear. You can push in. You're going to get so much more use with your drones by doing that. Never undervalue your drones. And the final major point I want to make in this video is playing the correct role. There is a bunch of different roles in this game for both sides. You've got, of course, support operators. You've got entry frag operators. You've got some flex operators as well. But it's just making sure that you're going to do an operator which is best for your task. If you're a defender, let's say you're going to go on a roam. You're going to cause some issues to the attackers, try kill some time, maybe take a few enemies out. Well, then you're much better going operators such as Vigil. His gadget makes him invisible to drones during his active period. That means it's going to be harder for them to find you, and it complements the role that you're playing. Whereas an operator such as Wamai, for example, his magnets, which catch projectiles that are thrown by the attackers, come to him over time, meaning that he has to stay alive if he wants to get the most out of his gadget use. So there's not really a point in going Wamai than roaming because all that utility in his pocket which is just waiting to be deployed is going to be useless because he's either going to A, die outside of sight or B, be pretty late by the time he gets back. And a lot of those gadgets which he has could have been useful before. So it's definitely just making sure that if you're going to play this role, you are equipped for it. If you're going to go run away from sight, at least don't bring an operator which would have been useful to be an anchor. Same for attack. If your teammates have drawn you in a room and they say, oh, there's an enemy here. It's much better dedicating an operator that, if dies, won't massively impact your team. You'd still be getting a little lost, but 30 seconds into the attacking round, I'd rather have an operator such as Capital, who's a really good operator, dying to the enemy than Thermite, who's our primary hard breacher. Yes, there's going to be a loss either way, but one of them is significantly more impactful. Simply, a lot of operators are more valuable than others on the team. And and if you're going a more valuable operator, such as a hard breacher, and you're taking the head on gunfights early into the match, then you're doing something wrong. Again, all this stuff you'll pick up over time, because if you're going a valuable operator like that and you're dying early, you're going to realize how much that impacts your team and you're just going to start losing more. I genuinely do think that failure is the best teacher in Siege, because Siege is so addicting that you want to win. You want to stop making these mistakes. You're going to stop making these mistakes because you're just going to keep losing and you're not going to enjoy it. The game will force you to learn. And if you're not up for that, then you picked up the wrong game. So yes, be sure to let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. I really hope this video did help you if you are a new player and you take a lot of these tips on board. Drop a like on this video if you did enjoy. Subscribe if you're new. I shall catch you later. I love you all. Stay safe. Peace.